Dr. O'Brien said, I'm part of the uh, APP Neurology Residency Program here, and I've been really thankful for all the help you guys have given me over the last um, year or so. And today I'm going to talk about a case Dr. Morgan Lander and I saw back when I first started that we've been following, the red ear syndrome. Um, so the patient history, uh, it was a 40-year-old right-handed female with a past medical history of Hashimoto's thyroid disease and pretty significant migraine who presented um, for evaluation of just left ear flushing and burning that started about a year ago. Um, symptoms kind of appeared out of nowhere acutely one morning when she noticed uh, in the mirror that her left ear was red um, and then subsequently warm to the touch. Over the next few months, um, the ear pain pro progressively got worse um, and turning into a, like a burning sensation that she described like it was on fire. And the only uh, relief she was receiving at that time was uh, an ice pack that she was using at home. During these episodes, um, it kind of presented like a migraine. Oftentimes she would get a migraine with it, um, with uh, left-sided head pressure, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. Um, and these could occur you know, one to 10 times throughout the day, or they could remain in a static state throughout the day. Um, by the time she saw Dr. Morganlander and myself, uh, she had seen an endocrinologist and her women's health doctor, but without resolution of symptoms because they did, they did some labs where they didn't really do a whole lot of management. Um, they tried 20 milligrams of propranolol that had been started, but it didn't really lessen the severity very much. Um, and so by this point, I, you know, Dr. Morganlander knows all this stuff, but I needed to look at my uh, nerves uh, of the ear. So there's the picture of the patient right here. Um, you can see how bright and red it is compared to her face and her neck down here. Um, and the main nerves we're looking at here are the greater auricular and the lesser occipital. Um, depending on what nerve innervation of the ear picture you find, they're all gonna be a little bit different, um, but this is pretty consistent. So those are the two nerves that we'll talk about again in a little bit. And then as well as nerves, I wanted to look at the vasculature of the ear. So this um, superficial temporal artery that comes off the external carotid comes up and then gives off this posterior auricular branch, which is the one we are kind of concerned with that goes back here behind the ear. And so intervention, um, other than the blatant flushing and warmth to the touch of her left ear, her neurological exam was uh, normal, including autonomic function. So at the time we opted to increase the dose of the beta blocker from 20 to 40, try a short burst of prednisone, um, and we also sent off a Mayo dysautonomia panel, which uh, came back negative. She continued to follow up with us, uh, reporting minor improvement, but still no resolution, pretty, uh, and so she was still having some significant distress with this pain. So we started gabapentin, um, which was later increased through my chart um, up to 800 milligrams TID. Later on down the line through another visit, well, we tried Cymbalta 20, daily, um, again, without major relief. Uh, so at this point, we decided maybe let's try to send her to the Duke Pain Clinic for um, uh, a block of those two nerves that I talked about, the greater auricular and lesser occipital. And those did for maybe a few days help her, but they were not long lasting and she was right back to where she was. Um, significant improvement finally did come uh, when we tried Amavig which we all know is a headache medication. It's one of the new ones, a CGRP receptor antagonist. Um, and a CGRP does have a role in vasodilation and migraine. So what is this? Uh, I, I venture that no, not many of you have heard of this um, unless I've talked to you about it. Um, so there's another picture of someone with red ear syndrome. Um, so it's a rare syndrome. There's only about a hundred literature case reports. Um, and if you want to find papers actually written about it. I wanted to know if the pool is right that comes from each one person. Uh, Beth, can you mute, mute please? Thank if you. you. If you want to find uh, case reports about it, there's three to five maybe that you can find. Um, so it's a rare syndrome of severe burning and flushing of the external ear, just like you can see there. It's very warm to the touch. The patients often describe like their ear is on fire. Um, it can radiate down into the jaw um, and even into the neck down that the pattern of that greater auricular nerve. It's typically asymmetric. And though we don't have many case reports, it does appear to affect females slightly more than males. Attacks uh, range in severity. They can last minutes, they can last hours, they can happen once a day, they can happen 20 times a day. Um, 
and again, we, we all get this from these about 100 case reports. It's not yet fully, um, excuse me, let me move my toolbar here. It's not yet included in the revised ICHD3 um, criteria, um, although it does often go hand in hand with patients with headache. So what do we think is going on here? We don't really know. Unknown pathophysiology, it's a theorized dysautonomia. Um, there is a good paper um, that talks about the vasculature, the parasympathetic uh, vasculature, and the potentially poor ability of the sympathetic perivasculature nerves to keep the microvessels constricted, allowing the parasympathetic division um, to go unopposed and to give this massive dilation of that area specifically, which was, would explain the flushing, the swelling, and the subsequent nerve irritation. Another proposed mechanism of dysfunction is uh, C2, C3 spinal nerve dysfunction, which give off those two branches I talked about earlier, uh, specifically the greater auricular nerve. Um, and then another possibility is that it's potentially a type of trigeminal autonomic cephalgia not yet fully understood. Um, so if any of you do see this, um, I would urge, you know, we, we see Amovig works. Um, gabapentin might work in some patients, but uh, give it your best shot if you see it. Um, and I, there's my references. And I'd just like to say thanks to Dr. Morgan Lanner and Dr. Collins for helping me through this case. Thank you very much, Jacob. So, uh, Jacob, can you send Will your slides? Because this would definitely make a great tweetorial. Sure. And yeah, that'd be um, great. I definitely think it's worth a publication if nobody has uh, reported that the syndrome responds to uh, those medications. And uh, you also presented to this at the North Carolina Neurologic Society. Yes, sir. I did a poster there. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. All right, so uh, to introduce a uh, grand round speaker today, uh, I'm going to send it to Chris Eckstein. Thanks, Rich. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this week, we're continuing our series of chief resident grand rounds uh, with Kristen Veal. So um, Kristen came to us from Oklahoma, where she did her undergrad and medical school. Uh, I was actually fortunate to uh, work with Kristen her very first week at Duke during her intern year on the general neurology service. I started recruiting her to neuroimmunology pretty much that week, so it should come as no surprise that she's going to stay with us at Duke to do neuroimmunology fellowship next year. Um, and today she's actually going to be talking to us about high efficacy therapies in uh, demyelinating disease. Take it away, Kristen. Thank you, Dr. Eckstein. There it is, we got it. Okay, so like Dr. Eckstein said, um, today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about approaches to treatment in patients with relapsing multiple sclerosis and what data we have so far um, to help guide our treatment decisions. So just for some objectives today, we'll review the possible pathogenic mechanisms behind multiple sclerosis I hope that we'll understand the two main treatment approaches in the care of patients with MS. We'll discuss kind of the risks and benefits of both of these, and then review some of the current and ongoing research behind um, this topic. So first, um, I would like to review just a little bit about the background into the proposed pathogenic mechanisms of different stages of multiple sclerosis. We, we don't know the exact mechanism underlying MS, but there's quite a bit of literature and ideas. Um, and I do, after talking with Dr. Skeen, I know that he might be going into this topic a little bit more at a future grand rounds, but we'll, we'll briefly discuss it now. So we do know, you know, in relapsing multiple sclerosis, we see the presence of these classic demyelinating plaques within the white matter of the central nervous system that we're all familiar with. These relapses are acute focal inflammatory lesions of the CNS that are thought to represent kind of bulk invasion of inflammatory cells, including CD8 positive T cells and CD20 positive B cells into the brain and spinal cord um, with a significant disturbance in the blood brain barrier. <clears throat> the CD4 positive T cells are also thought to be involved in the initiation of the immune response. So these relapses are classically how we monitor disease activity in patients with relapsing MS. However, relapses are occurring on top of this chronic um, 
immune process that's going on. And it's this chronic inflammatory process that accounts for a lot of the disability we see in MS. We know that MS is not only a disease of the white matter, but also involves the gray matter of the cortex, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. Um, however, cortical lesions are much more difficult to detect, with some studies citing that only 10 to 15 percent of cortical demyelination can be detected with the modern MRIs that we kind of use on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we also need to look at the progression, which is the accumulation of not only demyelination, but also axonal loss and neurodegeneration, which can be separate from the areas of focal inflammation. So the progressive phase of MS, whether that's secondary progressive or primary progressive, seems to be characterized by more activity of plasma blast and plasma cells. Um, and this inflammation can be present in the large tissue spaces, of the brain and spinal cord. Um, including meningeal and perivascular infiltrates, which are then associated with this kind of slow expansion of pre-existing white matter lesions, subpeal cortical demyelination, and damage to both white and gray matter. And it's likely that, you know, the inflammatory T and B cells cause activation of microglia and macrophages, which result in tissue damage um, kind of ongoing throughout the disease course. So again, this is a lot unknown and more complicated, but I think it's important to just focus on looking at, we both look at relapses and progression as well in MS. And I think next that kind of goes into, it's important to also talk about the natural history of relapsing MS. Um, with the information from the previous slide, we now know that relapses are not responsible for all progression in MS. Um, and progression independent of relapses can be correlated with brain volume loss. Um, a majority of patients with relapsing MS will convert to a disease course that's characterized by slow progression that is independent of relapses in about 10 to 15 years from disease onset, which right now we kind of term secondary progressive MS. Many studies have shown that once that course of secondary progressive MS is very similar to primary progressive MS, and that at that point, um, disability and survival curves are no different between patients with superimposed relapses and those who don't have relapses. Again, kind of just um, imparting the point that, that relapses aren't everything. So now um, we'll go into reviewing the two main treatment approaches classically that um, have been used in patients with relapsing MS. We have the early in intensive uh, treatment group, which is characterized by initiating treatment with a high efficacy medication at the time of diagnosis. Um, these high efficacy medications are typically considered to be alemtuzumab, um, which is a monoclonal antibody that's directed toward the CF52 surface antigen on B and T cells, um, D B and T lymphocytes, macrophages, and other white blood cells. Natalizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the alpha-4 subunit of Integrin, which actually blocks lymphocyte entry into the CNS. Our anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, which include rituximab, oprilizumab, and ofatumumab. Um, mitoxantrone, which is an intercalating agent that results in DNA crosslinks and strand breaks. And cladribine, which is a purine analog that targets and suppresses lymphocytes. I do have an asterisk next to cladravine um, because it's one that's left out in a lot of the studies that we're about to review um, and some of the future studies as well. And then on the other hand, we have escalation therapy, which is characterized by initiating treatment with a medication that has moderate efficacy at the time of diagnosis and only escalating to our high efficacy medications if relapses occur. The moderate efficacy medications are typically considered our beta interferons glutiram or acetate, teraflunamide, dimethyl fumarate, and the S1P inhibitors, which include <clears throat> fingolimod, saponamod, and azanamod. The S1Ps um, also have an asterisk because they actually probably fall somewhere in between high efficacy medications and moderate efficacy medications. But for the purposes of today, a lot of the studies that we'll review um, in the ongoing trials put those under escalation therapy. So for today, I have put them there as well. 
So next a little bit into why, why is this an important topic? Um, I think it's important because there are still significant differences in prescribing patterns um, kind of everywhere, but even amongst providers in our own community. And I think it would be helpful for optimal patient care if, if we could review kind of what results and best outcomes for patient and apply that to um, our everyday care. So this was very kind of brief using the Slicer Dicer tool on Epic. We, I searched by patients that had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis listed in their chart within the past three years at Duke University Hospital. And then I separated those patients out into those receiving care from DUH neuroimmunology providers, which is represented by the green columns. And then those receiving care from all other providers, whether that's providers here at Duke or they're receiving care elsewhere in the community and they're here. Um, and those are represented by the purple columns. And what you can see is that there is a significantly higher um, proportion of patients that are in care, the neuroimmunology clinic on higher efficacy medications at 42.3% compared to 13% of other providers. And then if you are looking at the moderate efficacy disease modifying therapy, um, there's 38.6% in the neuroimmunology practice versus 30.2% um, in other providers. Again, I'll kind of emphasize that cladribine here, I put under a high efficacy DMT and then the S1P inhibitors I considered as moderate efficacy DMTs. Again, just to go with the kind of the theme I had put them in for this talk at least. And obviously this is kind of, there's no way to, when I was using Slicer Dicer, you don't know, I can't review patient cases. So it's, it's always a little bit, has its limitations for sure. So now um, I'd like to go into what influences our choice of disease modifying therapy when we're seeing patients. Um, there was some qualitative studies that basically just interviewed providers and gathered common themes that they reported impacted their decisions um, about prescribing DMTs. And these themes were, I think, things we could all guess, um, but they included perceived likelihood of an individual patient having an aggressive disease course, perceived risk associated with medications, um, their familiarity and prior experience with prescribing these medications, and then their peer networks and prescribing cultures at their institutions. So kind of going off of that, first topic or the first bullet point on the last side, which was the perceived risk that my patient will have an aggressive disease course. I think that then poses the question, well, can I adequately predict which of my patients will have an aggressive disease course? Um, so you'll see that I've listed some common risk factors that we cite um, as predisposing someone to having an aggressive disease course. But in reality, these are really all just modest risk factors um, and have a lot of conflicting literature behind them. If we look at sex, for instance, one study showed that men reached an EDSS score of six sooner than women at 8.2 years versus 9.7 years. However, the absolute coefficient of magnitude was only about 0.17. And other studies that I saw showed no significant difference um, associated with sex and disability. Later age um, at onset is also commonly discussed, but again, this is only a modest risk factor with patients diagnosed at later ages, typically cited at greater than 40 years, showing faster rates of disability accrual. But again, that absolute coefficient of magnitude in the um, one study was only 0.03, so pretty small. Other factors we common, commonly consider are higher baseline EDSS at diagnosis, frequency of relapses, early cognitive dysfunction, um, new lesions within the first few years of symptom onset, early OCT changes in the presence of pyramidal sphincter or cerebellar signs. And so I think that then on the flip side, what is also important is, do I know which of my patients will have a benign disease course um, and how common really is benign multiple sclerosis? Um, most studies will classify benign MS as an EDSS of less than or equal to three at 15 years from disease onset. Um, however, we know that the EDSS is not perfect um, and it really relies heavily on motor outcomes rather than cognitive dysfunction or fatigue, which can both greatly impact our patients' daily lives and their ability to work. One population-based cohort study of a little over a thousand patients 
showed that only 2.9% of patients had low morbidity consistent with benign MS at a disease duration of 15 years. Another showed that out of around 4,500 patients, only 13% had a benign disease course when you classified that as an EDSS of less than one, absence of disability, and an ability to work at least part-time. There was also a recent survey using the North American Research Committee on MS that showed participants of a mean age of 55 years. Out of all those patients, 58% of them were not working and 48.5% were receiving disability benefits. Um, so it's, I think, considering both of these concepts is really important when we're trying to start treatment for patients. So thanks for letting me kind of review those key points that I think are good to keep in mind before we go into what literature do we have at this point that helps guide our treatment decisions. So first, we'll kind of go into some studies. The first I'd like to talk about is the Danish observational study. It's a observational non-randomized study. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that DMTs are provided free of charge in Denmark at 14 public MS clinics, and it's mandatory for all of those treating clinics to report their clinical data to the Danish MS registry. So they took all patients um, with a diagnosis of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis who were initiated on first-time disease-modifying therapy between 2001 and 2018. They considered high efficacy medications to include natalizumab, fingolimod, alemtuzumab, cladribine, daculizumab, and ocrelizumab. So they actually had 195 patients that were started on high efficacy disease modifying therapy that were then one to one matched with patients with similar baseline characteristics that were started on moderate efficacy disease modifying therapies. They were able to control for age sex, disease duration, pretreatment relapse activity, baseline EDSS score, and baseline T2 lesion burden on MRI. They used a primary outcome of time to six months confirmed EDSS worsening and a secondary outcome of time to first relapse. And what they found was that patients who were started on a high efficacy disease modifying therapy had a 47% lower rate of EDSS worsening and a 50% lower rate of first relapse. Um, another part of the study that I actually thought was interesting was that there was an observed increase in the use of high efficacy disease modifying therapy in treatment naive patients with increasing calendar year. And this actually correlated with updates to the Danish treatment guidelines that um, said that you could consider high efficacy DMT and naive and treatment naive patients, whereas previously that wasn't really listed as a, a recommendation or a possibility. So the second study that we'll look at is um, a population-based cohort study that was out of Southeast Wales. This data was collected um, or reviewed from 1998 to 2016. Um, they considered high efficacy disease-modifying therapy to be alemtuzumab and natalizumab, and moderate efficacy disease-modifying therapy to be interferons, glutiramer acetate, dimethyl fumarate, fingolimod, and teraflunamide. Um, so you can see that fingolimod does switch around a little bit on high versus moderate efficacy. So in this study, there was 592 patients, 104 of which, which was about 17%, were prescribed high efficacy disease modifying therapies and 488, which was about 82.4%, were prescribed moderate efficacy um, disease modifying therapy. There was... Um, one difference in the groups, and they noted that the pretreatment annualized relapse rate was higher in the early intensive treatment group versus escalation. So they looked at a primary outcome of five year change in EDSS, and then their secondary outcome was time to sustained accumulation of disability. And what they found was that, again, the early intensive treatment group had a lower change in EDSS score at five years compared with the escalation group. Um, they also noted that patients in the escalation group had an increase in EDSS score of 1.2 over five years, actually despite all of these patients undergoing appropriate surveillance and escalation to high efficacy DMTs, compared to only 0.3 increase in the early intensive treatment group. The median time to sustained accumulation of disability was six years, 
in the early intensive treatment group and only 3.1 years in the escalation group. So the third study we'll look at again is a retrospective international cohort study that was um, from data collected in the MS base registry and the Swedish MS registry. So here um, you had to have a clinical diagnosis of relapsing remitting MS with at least a minimum of six months of consecutive treatment with a high efficacy DMT, and then a minimum follow-up of six years since your first symptom to be included. This one's a little different. They categorized patients either into an early group, which was characterized by receiving high efficacy DMT within two years of disease onset versus a late group, which received high efficacy DMT between four to six years after onset. They considered high efficacy DMTs to be rituximab, ocrelizumab, mitoxantrone, alimtuzumab, and natalizumab. There was 213 patients that were in the early group, and then those were matched against 253 patients that were in the late treatment group, and they were matched to have similar age at onset, sex, number of relapses within the preceding 12 months, um, the same amount of delay in diagnosis, and the same median EDSS. And their primary endpoint was looking at disability uh, measured, from, measured with the EDSS from six to 10 years after disease onset. And again, we see that the early treatment group had a statistically and clinically significant reduction in disability with an EDSS score on average one point lower um, and sustained over six to 10 years. After both groups had been exposed actually to high efficacy DMTs for six years, you still saw that the cumulative risk of disability progression continued to diverge in favor of the early treatment group, which with this study is the first one we'll talk about that actually commented on the fact that the benefit you saw from treating patients early with high efficacy medications um, continued to persist even after other patients were started on high efficacy medications, but just at a later point in their disease course. So here we'll look at some of the graphs that were taken from this study. Um, you'll see that the what we're looking at is the x-axis represents time. And on this graph, we're starting at year zero, which was the time of initiation of first disease modifying therapy for patients. The y-axis is the cumulative hazard of progression. The red line is the late group and the blue line is the early treatment group. And we can see that the early treatment group has a significantly lower risk of progression when compared to the late treatment group. And the next graph is similar, but on this graph, it's actually starting at year six of this um, review, at which point all of the patients were now on high efficacy therapies. And you can see that over time, the cumulative risk continues to diverge in favor of the early treatment group versus the late treatment group. So the next study I'll mention is again, you'll kind of see a theme for now at least that this was a retrospective observational cohort study that came out of the Italian MS registry. So they took treatment naive patients with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis with a follow-up duration of at least five years um, a diagnosis within three years of disease onset, and at least um, three EDSS scores. They considered um, early intensive treatment to be natalizumab, alimtuzumab, mitoxantrone, fingolimod, and cladribine, and ocrelizumab, um, and they considered escalation therapy to be the interferons, glutiramer acetate, teraflunamide, dimethyl fumarate, and azathioprine. Um, patients were again one to one presensity score matched for baseline covariates at the time of DMT start. And they had 363 pairs that they then reviewed. Um, early intensive treatment patients were noted to be older at time of first DMT start with a shorter disease duration and a higher baseline EDSS compared to the escalation group. Um, but it was noted that even with this, that early intensive treatment was strongly associated with lower disability progression. And then again, just as the, the previous study we noted, this effect continued to increase over time, despite all patients in the escalation group eventually being escalated to high efficacy um, medications later. And here um, is a similar graph to, uh, for this study where the y-axis represents um, observed EDSS score 
um, and the x-axis is time from DMT start. You'll see that the yellow line is the escalation group, and then the um, red is the early intensive treatment. <clears throat> you can see that there is lower disability progression in the early intensive treatment group, again, in this study. So um, the last uh, study that I'll review for you today is um, a, a retrospective review that's out of the Norwegian MS database. And here um, they considered moderate, moderate efficacy DMTs to be the interferons, clotirimer acetate, teraflunamide, and dimethyl fumarates. And then the high efficacy DMTs were natalizumab, fengolimod, and alimtuzumab. In this study, they actually looked at what they considered to be no evidence of disease activity, which is um, defined as no history of clinical relapse, no sign of clinical disease progression by EDSS, and no new activity on MRI. Um, they were looking at 694 patients. Of the patients that were started on high efficacy disease modifying therapy as their first drug, 68% achieved this no evidence of disease activity at one year and 52.4% at year two. Um, of the patients that were alternatively started on the moderate efficacy DMTs as their first drug, 36% achieved no evidence of disease activity at year one and 19.4 um, <clears throat> at year two. And so um, next, what they did was basically looked at, was your high efficacy disease modifying therapy started as drug one, drug two, or drug three um, in your treatment kind of algorithm? And did that have an impact on how you did? And so what they found was that patients that were started on a high efficacy DMT as their first um, drug had an odds ratio of achieving no evidence of disease activity of 3.9 compared to moderate efficacy DMT, but this odds ratio is reduced to 2.5 if that medic high efficacy medication was their second drug and down to 1.5, which was not clinically significant or statistically significant for the third drug. So this again kind of shows us or highlights to me that we get the most benefit from these high efficacy medications early on in the treatment of patients with MS. So of course there are um, many limitations to these studies, including that they're all retrospective reviews with no, there's no current randomized controlled trials looking into this. Most relied on the EDSS, um, which again is heavily based on motor outcomes and not as sensitive for cognitive dysfunction or fatigue, which we know greatly impacts patients' quality of life and their ability to work and everything they'd like to do. And none of these studies actually evaluated the risks that were associated with these medications, which is a large influencer on treatment decisions for um, providers that are prescribing these medications. So um, ongoing trials, there are currently two large uh, randomized controlled trials that are going to investigate this topic. The first is Deliver MS, which is going to look at around 400 participants that are going to be randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to either early intensive treatment with a high efficacy DMT, um, which for this study can be alimtuzumab, natalizumab, rituximab, or oprilizumab versus escalation therapy, which they list as any other approved disease modifying therapy in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. Their primary outcome is actually gonna be brain volume loss from baseline to month 36, which is very different um, than what a lot of our previous studies have looked at, which is either EDSS most of the time, um, or even MRI findings, but this will be it's a new way to, to look at it. Patients must be ambulatory with a disease onset of less than five years, and they have to be treatment naive to be included. Their EDSS has to be less than 6.5 at their baseline visit to enter. And then there's treat MS, which is hoping to look at 900 patients. Um, here, the early intensive treatment choices include natalizumab, alimtuzumab, ocrelizumab, rituximab, cladribine, and ofatumumab. Um, and here, Patients can't have previously been on high efficacy disease modifying therapies, um, but they can have been previously on other DMTs as long as it wasn't within six months of them starting the study, which is slightly different given that deliver, they have to be treatment naive. Um, the primary outcome for treat is time to sustain disability progression and change in overall MS burden. So our more traditional way of looking at outcomes. <clears throat> 
Um, so after reviewing all this information, uh, let's go back to the common risk factors that are influencing our choice of disease modifying therapy. The first was, well, what's the likelihood that my patient is going to have an aggressive disease course, which people associate with that's the patient I should use high efficacy medications for. Um, but I think it's important to, to realize that it's very difficult to determine which patients will have an aggressive disease course and accumulate that sustained disability over time quicker. And then again, that most of our risk factors cited uh, for predicting an aggressive disease course show only modest effect. Um, and there's a lot of conflicting publications in a majority of these. And then I think on the other side, again, it's, it's important to remember that what defines benign multiple sclerosis, um, and in reality, a vast majority of our patients will develop significant disability that impacts their daily lives and ability to work. Um, and so is that truly common to see? We also discussed the proposed pathogenic mechanisms behind MS and know that relapses are not responsible for all disability progression. Um, and that even once you've gone into secondary progressive MS or, or your primary progressive MS patient, there's really not a lot of relapses don't have a great impact on disability accrual. And so therefore, if we're going off, if we're escalating patients treatments based on really only acute inflammatory lesions on MRI, we're likely not taking into account the whole picture um, and are likely under treating patients. We also saw, I mentioned briefly that with the Swedish and Italian studies, they showed that patients who are treated early with high efficacy medications had the lower chance of disability progression that actually remained present and even continued to diverge in favor of the early intensive treatment group, even when all those patients were eventually switched um, to high efficacy medications, which I think highlights the importance of timing um, and that early treatment gives you the most benefit for these patients. So the next factor, which we haven't touched on quite a bit is well, the perceived risks of these high efficacies disease modifying therapies, and is it worth it? <clears throat> I'll touch on two of the most commonly used high efficacy medications. I, I'm not going to get too into. I'm not going to get into all of them, but I think we most commonly use natalizumab and oprilizumab. Um, and I think when people people commonly think of the risk of PML associated with natalizumab when they're thinking about high efficacy MS treatments and their risks and whether they're going to put a patient on it. But I think it's important to note that now, um, it wasn't always the case, but now with the JC virus titer, um, natalizumab can be used safely in the appropriate patient population with adequate monitoring. So you can see um, with the chart here that in patients that are JC virus um, antibody negative, their risk of PML is 0.1 in a thousand. Uh, the remaining table stratifies risks based off of antibody index value and time on treatment. And you can see that patients with an index of less than 0.9 can remain on natalizumab safely for many years um, with a risk of 0.6 in 1,000 at uh, 61 to 72 months of therapy. There's a lot of data that's also coming out about decreasing the risk of PML with uh, natalizumab by using extended interval dosing, um, which is dosing every six weeks instead of every four. I'm not going to get too much into that now, but again, I think Dr. Skeen might be discussing that um, in, a, in a future talk. Um, so Ocrevus is the next one we use quite frequently. Um, Ocrevus is usually talked about with having a higher incident of infections. Um, but when you looked at Ocrevus, Ocrevus versus the interferons, um, there was a higher incident of infections at 58.5% versus 52.5%. But serious infections were actually numerically less um, at 1.3% versus 2.9. The most common infections are upper, upper respiratory tract infections, nasopharyngitis, UTIs, and the flu. Um, you do also see herpes-related infections were higher at 5.9% compared to 3.4 in the interferon group, but the majority of these respiratory and HSV-associated infections were mild to moderate and resolved with treatment. Um, Ocrevus can also be associated with a decrease in total Ig levels at 96 weeks. However, when they compared um, the decreased IgM levels to risk of serious infections, there was no apparent relationship between those things. And then lastly, I think like we all know, it's important to check for active or chronic hepatitis B infection prior to starting Ocrevus to avoid reactivation and serious liver damage. But again, we have the tools to check for that and screen our patients um, so that we're able to safely start them on these medications. <clears throat> 
So I think when you're comparing these risks um, to the risk of disability progression, that's going to significantly impact patients' daily lives and make it to where they can't work and, and, and do the things they'd like to do. Um, this seems worth the risk. The next is um, familiarity with medication and the prescribing culture. Uh, I think this is just, we um, kind of all focus on this as we practice, but it's important to stay up to date on new medications, especially as more and more medications are becoming available for the treatment of MS. Um, and then always just taking a step back and reviewing your own prescribing patterns, as well as the prescribing culture of your institution, um, just to make sure that you're staying up to date um, and evaluating the treatment of your patients. So take home points. Um, I'll say that early intensive treatment with high efficacy medications in patients with relapsing multiple sclerosis improves outcomes um, with significantly less disability progression. And when used in the appropriate patient population with our adequate screening tools, um, medications like ocrelizumab and natalizumab can be used safely with a relatively low risk of serious adverse events. Um, especially when we're comparing those risks to the risk of disability progression in our patients with MS. So next is just some of my references. And then I just want to say um, thank you to Dr. Eckstein, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Skeen, all of who um, listened to my talk and helped me with the, the research and, and literature review as I was preparing this. All of my co-residents and all of our wonderful attendings that have taught us for the past three years. Um, and most importantly, um, Frank, which is my dog, um, he listened to me practice this talk the most of anyone. And um, he was usually very underwhelmed, but uh, <laughs> he was a, a good listener, um, even though. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and then I also know that <clears throat> others will be on this call that can help me answer some of those questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kristen, and congratulations. Uh, so anyone uh, who has a question, either put your name or your question in the chat or raise your hand. I'll see if I can uh, keep that all under control. So I have a comment and a question, Kristen. Okay. First of all, how in the world do you become so facile with those names? <laughs> I uh, did really uh, practice this quite often. But, uh... I mean, it's amazing to hear you just rattle them off. And, uh, I think that's a, a sign that you've picked the right field. <laughs> the second question I have is the role of patient age and disease manifestation. How does, how does that play a role? Yeah, I think that it's, it's an interesting topic. I think that on one hand, if you're talking about age at onset, um, like when their disease manifested itself and when you're thinking about starting treatment. Um, that's kind of more when I talked about that age seems to be just a modest risk factor for whether you're going to have aggressive or benign disease course. And so I think if you're saying that, you know, a patient is diagnosed with relapsing MS at an older age, um, I still think that at least what we have so far is that we should treat those patients with high efficacy medications early to get the benefit. Um, as it, for whatever reason, there's some ideas I've talked about with Dr. Skeen, it seems to work better the earlier on in their disease. But I think that that does lead into kind of some future areas for research. I think that the next topic that's kind of interesting is, so if our disease modifying therapies work well at the beginning of the disease course and not aren't as good later, at what point might we be able to stop them? At what age and at what time in someone's disease could we think about peeling back? And, if, and I think that we don't have enough data on that at this point, but I think that um, at least for age at onset, I would still favor for now with our, um, the evidence we have treating patients with high efficacy medications. Thank you. So um, Joel has a question. Yeah, so Kristen, that was a great summary. Thank you so much. So assuming your patients will always listen to you, which may or may not happen, will you ever prescribe a lower efficacy MS drug to a patient with a new diagnosis of MS? And if you will, what, what will that patient look like? So I think that <clears throat> the time where I could see that being the, the best course of action is if a patient, despite, you know, kind of talking with them about the risks and the benefits and counseling them if they are at this point, you know, not wanting to take an IV medication, like an infusion or an injectable, um, which at this point 
those are high efficacy medications and, and they're not willing to take the risks or it's inconvenient for their life, that's when I might use one of the oral moderate efficacy medications. Um, and I think that that brings up another point on here is if we are going to start a moderate efficacy medication, what is the threshold for switching? And I think if I did that for a patient, I would be very, um, I would stay on top of monitoring them for not only relapses on MRI, but progression in their um, EDSS over time from year to year, and then really try to, if they are progressing, push them to switch to medications early on to possibly still get that benefit. Um, I think, again, that kind of goes to how early is early for high efficacy medications, um, which we still don't know. But if I noted a patient was progressing, I might counsel them a little bit more on switching to something better. Uh, sorry, Rich, is it okay if I ask a question? Fire away. Uh, do we know if there's a, <clears throat> any factor of like patients like being either opposed to going to higher efficacy because of concerns for side effects? Or is there like a, a factor of like how much patients want to be on a higher efficacy versus a lower one? I mean, do we account for that? It's as an interesting question. I didn't look into any like qualitative research on, I, you know, there's qualitative studies looking at why providers choose one versus the other and risk is definitely cited, um, but I didn't look for qualitative studies into patient population, which I could imagine would be a similar thing. Like they're, they're um, worried about the risks. And I think um, with talking with Dr. Skeen, I think he had a great way of, of approaching that with patients and um, comparing like the risk of PML with Tysabri to you know, the risk of death in childbirth, you know, and, and seeing that those risks, if you're comparing risks like that, it helps patients to kind of understand in a real world way of of how, how risky is it really? And um, so Dr. Skeen commonly uses that. And I think that would, could be a way to help relate it to patients more. Um, but I could also see easily that it's, I mean, case symptom, now you can take your injection at home. You're still having to give yourself an injection, but at least you're not coming into an infusion center um, or the infusion center coming to you. But I could see that oral medications are probably just more convenient sometimes for patients. Um, great, yeah. Like COVID right now, people are more yeah. hesitant about yeah. thinking about it. They don't want to come in. in a severe sense. Yeah. And they're like thinking, oh, is this like really dangerous? And it's not really. Mm -hmm. like, Which case symptom I think is, um, is good from that fact. You can right. do it at home or, you know, mm -hmm. on the go. All right. Uh, well, uh, congratulations and welcome uh, to the future. And uh, uh, everyone else uh, and Kristen, don't forget the photo shoot in about 15 or 20 minutes and everyone have a safe day. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you.